Unit six is developmental psychology. This one's a bit um, awkward, the way they uh, lay it out. So I've changed it a little bit. It's all the content's exactly the same, but the, the way they, they present it in the unit guides and in most textbooks is just, they kind of throw a bunch of different uh, psychologists and their developmental theories uh, or contributions to developmental psychology. Which is again, just basically how you progress physically and uh, psychologically, uh, cognitively and, and all that, uh, from conception all the way till, till death for your whole life. Um, it was kind of messy initially, but there were some theories that while not entirely correct early on in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, did actually give us a good idea about how to view the lifespan and development and finding out that there are common um, pathways and milestones uh, when when talking about development uh, in human beings. So uh, the way I'll kind of do it is I'll basically just kind of give you the physical info about, about what we know um, and about some of the early stages uh, all the way up to about adulthood uh, and I'll cover adulthood a little later when we talk about Eric Erickson and, 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 and so forth. But until then uh, I'll go over just the basics on how you do develop physically and how that results in mat maturation, which is biological changes in, in your brain and body that result in changes in abilities and behaviors and thinking, um, and how that goes into puberty and then how puberty, um, of course, occurs and how you sexually and, and uh, psychologically, mentally, cognitively uh, reach full maturation. And then uh, we'll also talk about some uh, um, average gender differences between uh, males and females. And then of course, a bit about um, the uh, one, 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 ten thousandth, one, one thousandth of a percent, I think it is, uh, of intersex people. Maybe it's one, one hundredth percent. I'll double check that. But um, that's how we'll, we'll go about it. And then I'll go over the various theorists that have tried to lay out these developmental timelines um, and then um, various others that have contributed to specific types of development like cognitive development or moral development and, and all of those. So starting first, uh, we have conception, of course. That's when you are conceived. That is when uh, uh, the sperm and the egg uh, end up meeting. They can join. Uh, once the sperm meets with the egg, uh, the DNA, uh, essentially take half the DNA uh, from, from the Y chromosome, from the sperm, and half from the X and they combine for a unique combination. Uh, so immediately that cell, when it's created, is a, is a unique uh, DN genetic code that is different from the mother and the father, but it's comprised of the two uh, in a different combination with different active um, alleles. So that's conception. Uh, you have, of course, the uh, sperm and the egg. Sperm plus egg equal new cell uh, called the zygote. And again, that is... Um, uh, a unique genetic code. It is different than the father and the mother. It's just half put together randomly uh, between the two. So that's conception. Uh, most, in the first two weeks, I think it is, more than half of these zygotes just die. Um, but the half that go on have a much better chance of living. After 10 days, it attaches itself to the uh, wall of the uterus in the female. And that's where the uh, rest of it's going to take place. Well, all of it, really. Uh, and that's what we refer to as gestation, when essentially the Single cell starts multiplying and becomes later on, uh, uh, develops as a fetus and becomes a, a uh, baby slash human uh, later on in development. So uh, gestation, of course, is the, uh, it's actually a little closer to 10 months, but between nine and 10 months, depending, unless, you know, there's a premature birth. Uh, nine to 10 month uh, development of uh, cells slash fetus uh, until they are, uh, it's actually born, uh, whether that's uh, just regularly through the vaginal canal, or it's uh, an emergency C-section or, or a, an arranged C scheduled C-section, uh, if there's gonna be some sort of complication or difficulty. All right, um, while they're gestating, they of course do uh, attach the uterine wall, and I'm gonna do my best to do a terrible uh, female uh, uterine uh, gestation period. So there's the uh, belly, the baby of course is inside that. This is the expanded uterus. Uh, on that uterine wall, uh, you're gonna have the placenta, which is this, at least to me, uh, gross looking, almost like flesh flower looking thing. Like I saw, I saw the placenta come out with my son, so I was grossed out, but it doesn't gross everybody out. 
Um, nonetheless, it's very much necessary because that is what essentially filters and provides all the nutrients to the uh, uh, fetus as it's developing uh, over time. So right, that becomes, of course, a full-on human baby eventually. This is what the uh, zygote would be, or the fetus at this point, fetus. Um, this placenta here, placenta, is like a, uh, it's like a fleshy sac that essentially grows with the baby and usually comes out with the baby too and, and is discarded. But that's kind of like your nutritional uh, filter uh, from the mother to the, to the child. So that placenta is uh, quite critical. That's gonna provide the nutrients uh, through the umbilical cord. Uh, it's gonna also provide the oxygen and it's gonna filter out um, any unused or discarded materials from the fetus because the babies don't have, um, I don't know when, when a baby actually, or a fetus actually has like a fully functioning kidneys, but initially they don't, that's for sure. Uh, so the placenta does that for them, filters that out. So you need that obviously, or the fetus will die and uh, you won't have a baby. So that occurs over uh, nine to 10 months and uh, out you come uh, at some point. So what we focus on here for this gestation period is it's actually quite critical for development. Uh, there are a lot of things that can go wrong here. Uh, and there's a lot of environmental factors that could influence and do influence how the fetus develops and it can also affect their brain development, which means it could affect their uh, cognitive abilities, behavior, uh, their, their personality, the likes, dislikes, their temperament, like the intensity uh, and frequency that they react to things uh, as far as emotionally. Uh, that is, it's a very important period and if that doesn't go ideally, then you could potentially change, alter, or damage uh, that uh, future person uh, permanently. So there are several factors that go into this. Um, during this stage of gestation, hormone, the presence of hormones uh, are a major factor. The quantity uh, of testosterone and estrogen uh, are actually quite important for uh, development of the brain and, and other features too. Uh, so we know, for example, that uh, increased exposure to testosterone in the womb, for whatever reason, in males and females, um, makes them slightly better uh, regarding spatial intelligence. Like they can mentally rotate shapes and plug things in and, 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 and are better, more aware of their, their surroundings and, and direction. Um, largely, uh, and, it's, and it has an odd co positive correlation with this uh, presence of high levels of testosterone. It has other behavioral uh, implications too, but that, that one's pretty consistent. Uh, same with uh, their temperament regarding aggression too. Uh, but yeah, the presence of hormone uh, to the fetus during this gestation period does uh, quite have, have a major impact on brain development. They don't understand why exactly, but it does alter in some way the neural connections and circuits uh, of the brain uh, going forward. So hormones, uh, those have to be aligned properly to get uh, normal development. Uh, a lack of them or an excess of them will, uh, will they have major behavioral uh, and cognitive and developmental implications. So hormones are a major impact. You also have uh, nutrition, obviously. This is why uh, it's so important that women, when they are pregnant, that they get proper nutrition because if you deprive the uh, child of any nutrients that they need, whether it's uh, some sort of vitamin, mineral, or it's uh, just calories, or it's a particular macronutrient like uh, a fat or, or proteins especially, which are kind of your building blocks, um, that will of course alter their development as well. And we talked about that when we talked in Unit 5 about intelligence is... Um, one way to greatly improve the intelligence of a population is to make sure they get proper nutrition all the way from conception uh, to adulthood so that their brain can fully de uh, develop to its uh, fullest capacity. Because uh, lacking or getting improper nutrition can not only negatively affect the mother, but it can permanently uh, affect the child potentially negatively uh, as well. So that's why it's always so important. Another reason why they don't, they're so fixated on this uh, gestation phase, because not only do that proper nutrition, but there are a whole host of the things called teratogens, which are any, any molecular agent that can screw up somebody's development. I mean screw up like mutate it or, or make it function or develop abnormally. Uh, so these things can either be epigenetic, they can get in and actually activate or, or, or uh, uh, disable certain alleles and genes, which can totally uh, cause your developmental process to uh, malfunction as your brain and body are forming and the neurons are connecting. Um, so some examples of teratogens are uh, viruses. Certain viruses can do this. 
Um, you can also have uh, toxins. So, for example, why can't I think of any off the top of my head? Um, toxins, toxins, toxins. Oh, you're not supposed to get uh, too much mercury or caffeine. Things like that can negatively affect their development. Um, so, most women are advised not to eat um, either. No, they're not. Allowed, they're not advised to eat any fish at all or a very low amount because uh, fish, for whatever reason, have a high, high, much higher rate of mercury uh, inside them than other entities or, or plants that we eat, uh, and that can actually negatively affect them. So any, any toxins like that, any sort of poisons, any sort of chemical toxin, there's a whole host of them um, that can negatively impact the development of the fetus. And it can negatively affect the mother too, but uh, the fetus is the one that's going to be affected far more, uh, generally speaking. So viruses, toxins, um, and that can be any chemical or, or molecular toxin. Uh, radiation is another one. So any exposure to uh, excess radiation, whether it's knowing or not knowing, usually it's not knowing because you can't usually feel radiation, um, that could um, alter the gene sequences uh, and activate or deactivate certain alleles or cause mutations and cause the development to screw up. Uh, it's actually quite astonishing how many people develop um, normally, uh, considering how many things can go wrong in this stage. So virus, toxins, radiation, uh, and technically even stress too, uh, the presence of High amounts of cortisol and stress hormones in the mother uh, can negatively impact the development of the fetus. It also um, deprives the mother of uh, energy and resources uh, that are being used to address the, the uh, stress reaction. Um, that can actually deprive the child of nutrients and energy as well and, and affect their development negatively. So uh, those are all things to look out for. And what else did I want to mention here? Oh, here's another one. Um, this goes with the toxins. This is a really common one. Um, so almost any drug can do this, almost any drug. I mean like a narcotic, uh, oh, pharmaceutical as well. That's why they're so sensitive to uh, checking with your doctor if you take any even legal medication uh, because so many of them can have these uh, teratogenic effects and, and negatively impact the development of the child. Um, but also uh, the one of the most common ones and often unknowingly because sometimes women don't know they're pregnant for a few weeks or months even depending on the uh, particular one. Uh, and if they're consuming alcohol excessively or for a prolonged period of time or using certain medications or taking certain drugs, legal or illegal, uh, they're going to uh, risk um, negatively impacting the development of their child. Uh, and one of the most common um, negative impacts is uh, alcohol, specifically uh, a, a syndrome called fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, which can actually cripple the child physically and or uh, cognitively. Uh, as they develop uh, because the presence of alcohol is too high and it, it damages the cells and DNA as they are, as they are uh, forming, uh, which would permanently screw up the uh, future person. So that's why people are so sensitive to this gestational period as far as the mother's um, reducing stress and, and trying to keep anything that is pot potentially a, a, could have a teratogenic effect on the fetus uh, from occurring. So uh, when they do pop out, um, there is a normal sequence of development that most humans uh, abide by. Now, there are some ranges here, so it doesn't mean you have to be particularly worried if you or a sibling or your kid or whoever is far behind these, these measures. These are averages, so you can have some people be just fine and, and, and hit these milestones way late, uh, or be just fine and have them hit them early. Uh, it's all over the place, but there is a general pattern here uh, to this, and it is biologically based. So before I go into what those are, one of the people that really demonstrated and proved that uh, your biology is key uh, for your development, that, the, that your development isn't just random, like you don't randomly get these abilities, uh, there's actually usually a, a, a specific order to when you get them, and they're triggered biologically by our, our common human uh, genetic sequences. Now there are some variations obviously, which gives us all of our um, characteristics and ability differences and, and, and physical differences, all that stuff. Uh, but we do have a very common set of um, uh, developmental patterns and milestones, uh, and that is linked to biology. And the guy that actually first sort of asserted that is a dude named Conrad Lorenz. Conrad Lorenz. And uh, he did some work between the 1930s and 1970s, I believe, roughly speaking. Most psychologists do a lot of their major work in a 30 or 40 year time span. They usually get out and get their 
MAs or PhDs in their late 20s, early 30s, and they, they put they have a, a pretty high output but there's up until their 60s or so. So depending on the person, you get a good 30, 40 years of uh, uh, quality work out of them for the most part. Uh, Comrade Lawrence is a, um, he actually started out with, uh, and did most of his work on animals, uh, non-human animals, um, specifically geese uh, for, the, for, the, for the first one that really took off. But even though he was studying animals, non-human animals, uh, he does sort of discover this, pattern uh, to development, um, and that it was his assertion that it was biologically based, because it, it couldn't be environmental if you put all of these animals and raise them in separate um, scenarios without any influence from a prior generation or another person, and they still evolve the same. Uh, and that was, um, well, that was a logical deduction, and one that is um, almost certainly, well, is certainly true, uh, that the coding in our genes sort of determines this uh, this, how do, you, how do you phrase it, developmental path. Uh, and the environment does impact that, obviously. Uh, as you can see here, environmental uh, factors absolutely can weigh in and, and affect your DNA and development. Uh, but the, the general blueprint is biological, it's genetic uh, for the most part, and that's why we all have a very common set of patterns. So Conrad Lawrence actually did, uh, discovered this while um, working with geese. He actually studied and um, did a lot of work on imprinting which is basically when, uh, this isn't, doesn't apply to humans, but in geese, for example, I don't know all of the animals this applies to, but in geese, for example, there's this time period where you can, depending on, uh, if you take a, a fresh hatchling and you pair it with a mother, uh, it will fairly quickly, at one point, not only the amount of weeks uh, for this, but it will uh, imprint on what it believes to be its mother. So it will form this really close connection with and think that whatever this thing is, is its mother, and it will follow it uh, until it reaches its next development, developmental milestone where it starts to go off on its own. Uh, but that powerful connection where they identify with it as, as mother and follow it, uh, no matter where it goes, no matter how dangerous uh, or safe it is, until they hit their next milestone and start to venture off independently, uh, that's imprinting. Uh, and he did find that you could sort of do it to different non goose objects as well. I believe they did it to, uh, um, I don't know if he did this one, but I know that they've actually gotten geese and ducks to uh, believe that like a ball is their mother uh, or uh, a human is their mother and they get them to imprint on the ball or the human and then follow it around like it's like its mom. Uh, so he did develop, uh, did discover that um, and the research on that. And again, his assertion was it laid the groundwork for developmental psychology in that we have that biological uh, programming genetic code that, that largely dictates this. So uh, development is a largely biological process. Uh, so that's what he's important for. I remember when I first taught this class years ago and then they, they just had this in the, um, they didn't say why, they just had this in the uh, list of required topics. And I was like, well, why do we need to know about imprinting in geese? I don't understand why that has to it, um, but I found out a while later what his actual contribution was. Had to do some digging, but found it nonetheless. So, uh, imprinting, uh, and also too, he was uh, a, he also laid the foundation for what are known as understanding critical periods. So you do have this biological, you know, developmental path that's sort of written in your genetic coding with, of course, environmental factors, but the blueprint's already laid out. Uh, there are these, stretches of time where you kind of have to learn something. Something occurs, some sort of developmental process uh, occurs, and it happens at this time in your lifespan, uh, and it often has to occur in this time, uh, or it never happens, uh, or it's fixed that way. And, and that probably didn't make much sense, but here's what I mean. Uh, so critical periods. Uh, the critical periods uh, for imprinting, I don't know the exact time frame, but Depending on how old the chick is, like freshly out of its egg, uh, what you pair it with, it will identify as but that it will identify with that object or entity as its mother. That's the critical period. I can't do it later. Once it's already occurred, right after birth, what, with whatever it is or, or whoever it is, uh, it's done. It can't occur later. Uh, that's when it has to happen. Uh, so these are uh, developmental periods. that have 
to occur by or at a specific time, or they may not change or develop. So you can have this for humans. Um, you have, in your early years of life, there are several things you have to learn to do, which, which humans do automatically, by the way. If we talk about this with like language, for example, uh, human, uh, humans are uniquely programmed to want to, before they even understand what anything is, absorb language, understand it, and then replicate it and express themselves. So you don't have to like exactly teach a kid to talk. As long as the kid is there and you are talking around him or her or to him or her, preferably to him or her, preferably both, but as long as they're exposed to the language, they'll, they'll pick up on it automatically. Uh, writing and, and reading and, and, well, actually, they'll, they'll understand the grammar too, even speaking it. But you have to teach the reading and writing, which we talked about also uh, earlier in, in, in Unit 5. Yeah, it was Unit 5, uh, where that's actually a cultural phenomenon that's only about four or 5,000 years old that you actually have to teach and learn, and it's difficult. Um, the language process is not, it just occurs. But if it doesn't occur for whatever reason, if the kid's isolated or in, in some extreme cases of abuse where they like um, uh, deliberately don't, deliberately isolate the kid and don't expose them to language, if they don't learn it by age seven, they can't learn it. Uh, I don't know which part of their brain, whether it's the Broca or Vernica or both, don't develop properly, but if they don't, aren't exposed to uh, enough language by age seven, they will not be able to communicate or understand uh, verbal language uh, as, as other humans can. Uh, and there are a couple examples of that uh, historically of, of kids that were either, um, uh, what's the word, feral, uh, somehow survived on their own, like their parents died when they were young, but they somehow were able to survive, who knows how, uh, maybe with other people or whoever, but they weren't exposed to language or enough language, and then by the time they were, you know, found at age seven, eight, nine, or whatever, uh, uh, older ages, they weren't able to understand or learn language. At that, that time, that critical period had, had already come and gone, unfortunately. Uh, there was one girl who was isolated um, sadistically by her, I think it was stepdad and mom or something like that. I can't remember the details, but she was like isolated from people until uh, I think age 13, something way beyond seven. Uh, and she could not learn language. She could learn how to like uh, mimic words. Uh, I don't want to say like a parrot, that's not quite correct, but uh, she could learn the words for things, but she could not put them together and generate them, um, even consciously. Because I mean, if you think about the way we're talking, or I'm talking, or you're listening, or whatever, it's just flowing out. I'm not like thinking about each word that I say. So whatever mechanisms in our Broca or Wernicke areas that, that do that, if you don't develop them by age seven, they, they don't develop. And, and you might be able to make sounds or words or even identify things, but you won't be able to use grammar, uh, understand or communicate effectively without that. So that's a critical period. And Conrad, Conrad Lorenz was, uh, was a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Foundational, um, a very significant uh, psychologist for that reason. He does alert us to these biological uh, development, develop, development, developmental paths. Uh, of course, initiated by our, 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 our genes and our connections of, of neural networks. Uh, and then uh, these, these critical periods, too, where depending on the animal or person, you have this fixed amount of time where they have to learn something. If they don't, it won't change or they, they won't learn it properly. So that's his contribution to uh, developmental psychology. So let's go over a couple motor uh, skill developments. And then, yeah, well, then we'll do some other empathy stuff before we move on to... Uh, to uh, older children and uh, adolescents. So, um, Connor Lorenz, so uh, motor developments. That's a, uh, we'll, do, we'll do motor and cognitive. That's, I'm gonna include language in that with cognitive. I don't have a ton of it, like every single milestone for kids, but here, here's a basic framework for how most kids develop um, on average as humans uh, normally. So, um, by two to three months, they should be um, making eye contact uh, or smiling socially, not just randomly smiling, but smiling when they see you or something like that. Uh, in that two to four month range, um, that's showing them, that's showcasing normal development. Obviously, the earlier, uh, usually the better, but you can have examples where they learn this stuff later and they turn out to be just fine, uh, average or above average people. So, uh, motor cognitive development, uh, two to four months, they wanna, you wanna be able to, to maintain eye contact, 
track with their eyes, focus, uh, eye contact, uh, social smiling. And again, I don't mean just smiling at nothing, smiling because they see their mom or their dad or something like that. Uh, two to four months, I should put month, not year, month. Uh, by four months, uh, as far as motor, that's cognitive obviously, as far as motor development goes, they should be able to uh, hold up their head meaning you should be able to sit them up or whatever, and they don't just bunk, they don't lunk back. By the way, you didn't know that, uh, for newborns uh, up to like four months or so, you really have to like hold their head and their body because their head is actually too large to support itself. Uh, it could actually really hurt them. Uh, so you always have to hold both until they can, of course, uh, maintain their own head weight, which is starting about roughly four months or so. Uh, by the six month mark, they should be able to roll over and again, these are general, like there's ranges, like any kid could learn this between, you know, the four and the eight month mark, but six is about the average. Uh, roll over, and they're also at this point supposed to be able to, I believe, move objects from one hand to the other. They should be picking things up, even if it's all their fingers, and they should be able to exchange them from one hand to the other. So hand exchanges. Uh, at about eight months, they should be able to sit up on their own. Uh, and or begin the process of crawling. They should be at least trying to um, at that point. And again, there's a range here. Like um, um, you can have kids that develop this, especially the motor stuff late, and they end up being just fine as far as their coordination and, and motor ability later in life. Um, and this is also the point when they should be able to start grabbing things with three fingers or even two fingers. Uh, I'll put three finger. Grabs. That's a fine motor skill. Nonetheless, that's a motor skill. Uh, and they also might start babbling at this point, uh, making noises. Sometimes they can be speaking and saying words. Uh, it's rare, but it's, it's, it can happen as early as uh, six months. Um, it's, it's really early, but that it can occur. But by eight months, they should be trying to make noises in some, in some sense, like just making any sort of noise. So we hear that goo goo ga ga, that sort of stuff. You might even hear a couple early mamas or dadas or something like that. Even though they're not saying the word, but they're they're making the noise. Uh, that should be occurring at roughly the eight month mark. And again, there's a range on that, uh, which can be later and they can be just fine anyway. Uh, by 12 months, they should be uh, walking. Uh, and that could be assisted or unassisted, meaning like you could be supporting them partially as long as they're moving themselves or maybe independently. So some kids can develop that super early uh, and other kids can develop it later. Again, the motor skills aren't quite as critical as far as the the, uh, uh, the time uh, it takes them to learn. And this is the point where they should be uh, at least using one word. So they should ideally be able to say one or two words at least by this, by this point, the year mark. Uh, you can have those speech delays and still be okay, um, but if you're at that point and it hasn't happened yet, you should start looking into uh, maybe a speech therapist uh, or, or whatever. Usually the state provides those. Um, if not, you, know, you can look at the other ways of getting it. Uh, by 18 months, I actually forget it for 18 months. 18 months, they should be walking unassisted. Yeah, so I'll just put one to two years. Uh, they should be walking unassisted. Uh, by two, even running. All right, maybe earlier than two running. Uh, walking, that's uh, terrible writing. Walking unassisted is what it says. Uh, and they should be speaking in, uh, they should be, of course, acquiring more language as they go. And by two, you generally want them to be using like simple two word sentences like mommy up or uh, I'm hungry or something like that or I hungry or whatever it might be. Uh, they should be hopefully uh, using those by age two. Uh, but um, earlier is always fine and then uh, later can also be fine too depending on the situation. That's motor development and again, the fact that we could go out and look for these developmental patterns was sort of that idea laid out by Conrad Lawrence that we have this common biologically driven um, developmental sequence. Uh, it's in our genetic code. Uh, that's what we know now anyway. Uh, but uh, that's kind of the average uh, for uh, humans, male and female, is that sequence, roughly speaking. Um, there's also more cognitive ones too about like what they should be doing, like stacking blocks or putting them inside cups or, um, oh, is it six or four months? It's one of these two where they should be able to like, uh, they should have object permanency where they begin to understand, I forget if it's four or six months, but object permanency. This is where they 
realize that if you like take a toy and put it under a blanket, it doesn't cease to exist. Like if you do it before this point, before their object permanency understanding, um, they just, it just disappears to them. Like you put it under a blanket, oh, it's gone forever. And then like uh, if you pull it back out of the blanket, they're like surprised. Um, at this point, when they start developing object permanency, you, they should start to look for the toy. If you put it under a cup or under a blanket, they should maybe pause and look at it, but then they'll look underneath it or knock it over or, or, or search for it as if they know that it's there, even though they can't, they can't see it. All right, so that's the basic developmental path, and a lot of people have contributed to that. Uh, but there are a couple specific ones that I want to mention here. And again, this is largely thanks to uh, Lorenz's um, contributions and understandings about our common developmental uh, scheme. So uh, there was a psychologist named Mary Ainsworth uh, in the, uh, I think it was the 1950s. I want to say 1950s till the 1980s is when she did her, the majority of her work. But I think she did this part in the 50s. She, and this is pretty hardcore actually, she was, it was in Philadelphia, at some east coast town, Baltimore maybe. Um, she actually went around to like hundreds of houses and families on a daily basis, routinely, the same houses, just to go there, and it would be awkward, I would assume, but, and just observe. Like, she wasn't there to interfere at all. She would just sit there, and these, you know, families would agree to just let her watch. Like, she wouldn't give suggestions, none of that. She's just merely logging the development of these uh, kids uh, and, and, you know, what they're doing. Um, so not only, of course, she, uh, noting the, the motor development, but she actually found some uh, relational uh, milestones, too. So... Uh, here's some of the stuff that she noted that she's uh, done a lot of work on. Um, she isn't so much, as far as I know, she didn't like coin this term, but she's largely the one that did the research that at least generated this, uh, was um, a phenomenon known as stranger anxiety. And this can occur by, uh, I think on average, it's about the eight month mark for infants. Uh, that is where if the mother or, or father, whoever they see as a, as a parent and recognize it, it it's usually a mother, uh, especially in the 1950s, but it's usually a mother, um, but it could be somebody else, it could be grandma, and, and whoever's their, one of their primary caretakers that they identify and feel safe with. Um, they will play and act and be happy and normal as long as that person, again, usually the mother, is close, but the further away the baby gets from that person that they see as their caretaker and uh, they feel secure with, they become more anxious. They look around more. They're less comfortable. They start demonstrating, um, uh, you know, the signs of um, stress, like you know, the panicking, the increased breathing. Um, they'll they'll be more fussy and cry. They're clearly not comfortable. The further away their mother is, and if their mother's gone, then they they're in a complete stress um, uh, state. If their their caregiver is not there, uh, so they're very much. Depending on the personality of the kid, which again, you can actually see this early, if they're like more extroverted, like, oh, new person, and they're just wonderful and open, or they're like, and they're really reclusive if they're more introverted. Um, nonetheless, at this, at this point, if you ex take the caregiver far away or, or separate them, they, they get increasingly anxious the further away or more separated they are, uh, to the point that they can't function normally, at least in that moment. Uh, that's what stranger anxiety is. Um, all right, and then also, by about the one month, or sorry, one year point, and it can develop sooner or later, but certainly by year one is the average, uh, you have what's called an attachment bond at about the one year mark. And again, this is Mary Ainsworth's uh, work, and I sometimes I confuse these, but I'm almost positive that is her, her, uh, her primary uh, research contribution, besides, of course, logging all this data that helped us develop all of these things. Um, she uh, was largely responsible for research regarding the attachment bond, which is the bond that you have with that caregiver, um, usually mother, but it can also extend to other family members who are caregivers or are around frequently. Um, like my kids saw me, see me all the time, so uh, even though they were slightly more attached to their mother, who, who does choose to stay with them until they're about two and then we send them off to preschool, um, she wants to stay home with them. So they always had a, a slight preference for her, but they were just as comfortable with me because I was, I was around. But if I wasn't around enough or I didn't like kids or, or whatever, uh, I wouldn't get that bond. Um, nonetheless, they can form an attachment bond with their caregivers uh, or even sometimes their siblings if they're familiar enough. Um, I remember my parents used to, well, I'll tell, tell that later. Um, uh, attachment bond is where the kids will, um, they're, they're largely aware of the scenario. So once a parent, it's clear they're gonna leave, like they set them down, you know, or give them to somebody else and they're walking off or, or the kid's getting the idea that 
that the that the parent's going to be leaving them, whoever whoever it is they're really attached to, um, they'll start exhibiting stress, sort of similar to the stranger anxiety. That that of course is more so a fear of other people in distance, uh, but this is just an attachment, even if they're familiar with the person, like even if it's like say their grandmother, who they know, uh, but they don't see every day. Uh, the separation from the mother, even though it's the grandma they're familiar with, the uh, it will they will distribute uh, exhibit stress responses and, and cry and, and fuss. Um, and then, um, but you can help it out too by putting people who are close together, close with them. Like when my parents said that when my brother, he's younger than me, would, um, they would ever like go, you know, out to do something and my grandparents would watch us. And my grandparents were wonderful. My brother would just scream and cry, but if you put me next to him, he would just stop crying because there was some sort of familiarity or attachment bond there uh, with a brother. And I know my kids have that too, uh, you know, the youngest ones. Uh, in descending order, uh, feel that with their older siblings. Um, so it's a it's kind of a cool thing to see as a parent. But that's the attachment bond. And also, they are incredibly happy when reunited with uh, that caregiver or person, uh, even if they think that they're gonna be reunited with them uh, shortly. So like, uh, you can see examples of this too, like, uh, it's adorable, you see this with um, uh, my kids and, and any kid really. Like, even if they hear the voice of, of me or, or uh, my wife over the phone, they immediately like pick up and, and, and smile and, and get happy, or you FaceTime them or whatever. Uh, and when you, when you enter the room, they just light up, they're so happy to see you because uh, they form that attachment bond uh, with you. And the two are definitely linked, but uh, I, I think this kind of covers, this is a blanket term, is that attachment bond, and that forms by about year one. I'm trying to think if I want to talk about anything else Oh yes, there is something else I want to talk about before I before we move on to the next set of topics. Um, so Conrad Lorenz and this whole developmental path uh, scheme, he linked it to biology, and that actually is kind of its own offshoot. It's what we call the uh, maturation process. I think I mentioned that earlier, but I didn't discuss it. The maturation uh, process. It's basically the link between biology and 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 your development. Uh, it's how biological, I'll say physical, biological changes, physical, biological changes uh, in the brain. It, this obviously includes the rest of your body too. Like you can't walk until your ligaments, tendons, and muscles are, are developed enough to support it and, and, be, and are coordinated enough, but even that's linked to the brain. Um, how physical biological changes in the brain um, result in ability and behavior changes. And we can see a pretty common uh, developmental path in humans, broadly speaking, there as well. Um, I'm sure all of you know that if you had to sit here for 20 minutes and listen to me talk like you're probably doing this, this video, and I'm sure by now half of you have drifted off and gone away or, or have to snap back into it. Um, if you had to sit there and compete with a three-year-old to see who could listen the longest, almost certainly you would win. Right, and the older you get, uh, the more you're able to do that. That's not a coincidence. Uh, people just arbitrarily mature. It's actually physical changes in the brain uh, that allow you to do that. Um, we kind of mentioned it before. But mostly, it's increasing your the strength of development and um, and number of uh, connections in the circuits of uh, in neurons of, in your frontal lobe that allow you to focus and uh, practice impulse control. So if you even though you're bored or you're hungry or whatever, you can kind of like put that aside and focus on what you know you need to do that helps you out. Um, and your judgment, all that improves. That, that occurs slowly over time, but that's not just random. You don't just randomly get better at those things. It's because you're actually physically changing the composition of your brain. You are adding neural connections or strengthening them over time in your frontal lobe. And the, uh, the how I can phrase this, the determining factors in your behavior and ability shift from the more primitive parts of your brain, the limbic system, uh, and they begin to shift more towards your frontal lobe, which is why, you know, a toddler throws a tantrum and it's not enjoyable and you, of course, try to, uh, you know, use positive and negative reinforcement to avoid them. Um, but uh, those happen way more frequently than adult temper tantrums occur. Like if you saw an adult, if you saw an adult throw a temper tantrum like a toddler, like you probably call 911 because that that could be dangerous first of all but it, it would just be it'd be really really odd 
uh, to see a, a, um, an adult just screaming and flailing, throwing things and kicking things and stomping and screaming and crying, like that, that would be actually quite terrifying depending on the person and what they may or not have on them at the time. Uh, so that's the maturation process. And again, that, that it, we link that back to, to Conrad Lawrence and his connection between biological uh, influences on, on behavior. But that's the maturation process. So keep that in your mind, because that's kind of a common AP test topic, by the way, is, is ma the maturing proce process and maturation. Uh, and again, that's just physical, biological changes, meaning your brain actually grows and forms more physical connections between circuits and, and neurons, and that actually changes the way that you behave. It changes your, your, or at least alters your motivations and it alters your ability to uh, hold back on your impulses and make good judgments and uh, understand patterns and, and add experience and knowledge over time and apply those and make predictions. That's all uh, part of the maturation process, which is why you can't expect a three or four year old to sit here for 90 minutes and listen to somebody or, or do an algebraic equation or thinking the hypothetical about what if I did this, they literally can't do that yet. They don't have the, the, the hardware developed uh, quite yet. Certainly uh, they don't have the software yet, but they don't have even the uh, hardwiring in uh, to accomplish that. That occurs over time slowly as the brain physically develops and changes. That's the maturation process. So having said that, there are ways you can interfere with that. We've already mentioned some epigenetic effects and gestation. Those can uh, obviously uh, curtail proper development or normal development. Um, but also, uh, you can have environmental factors um, in actual parenting. Now, we do know, and we've, we talked about this earlier in Unit 1 and 2, um, your genes and biology do have a much larger causal role in your abilities and, and, and predispositions and all of that, but it's not all of it. It's only about half-ish, depending on the specific topic, ranging from like 40 to 60% of the uh, of the uh, responsibility for any particular uh, ability or predisposition. Uh, there's still, you know, a lot of room for uh, social influences or just not even, I don't mean society, culture specifically, I just mean like actual environmental issues like access to normal nutrition and safety in a, in a, in a less stressful environment, things like that. They all factor in. And then of course our own motivations and drives also factor into our behavior, uh, which again, you can tie back to, to, to genes as well. Uh, largely, but nonetheless, you can't interfere with it. And what I mean by that is, early on, the parents can screw it up intentionally or unintentionally uh, or haphazardly by exposing uh, the, the fetus or the child to harmful agents, teratogen, uh, whatever it might be, or they can deprive them of nutrition, but they can also emotionally deprive them. And that's what I'm talking about here. So we already know about the physical stuff. Obviously, they don't get enough nutrients, they don't develop properly. Obviously, if you don't, um, if you're exposing them to harmful teratogenic chemicals or whatnot, uh, they're going to develop improperly. But you can actually do it just by your interactions with them. So here's what I'm talking about. Uh, and you can thank the very, very, very controversial and, well, largely unethical, but still important uh, research by a guy named Harry Harlow, who I think was a contemporary of Conrad Lawrence. They didn't work together, so far as I know, but I believe they were doing their field work at around the same time between the 1930s and 1970s. Um, Harry Harlow had some very infamous uh, experiments with uh, developing primates. It was a specific type of monkey, I can't remember which one. It's one of the smaller ones, not like a great ape. But nonetheless, uh, they're still very social creatures and he wanted to see to what degree social contact influenced their development. Uh, so Harry Harlow, um, again, I can't remember the type of monkey, but he did uh, several monkey experiments ones that would certainly be denied ethically uh, by the, uh, uh, the animal board. So what he would do, there's kind of three things. There was one was the pit of despair experiment. That one's absolutely grotesque. Uh, but on a less unethical note, he did an experiment where he tested to see how monkeys developed with uh, re regarding their physical affection with their mother. So he took monkeys that would have a mother, just a regular, you know, other warm-blooded monkey mother, uh, and then monkeys with uh, rag doll mothers. So obviously not a real mother, but it was just literally a doll, like a cloth doll with a bottle, and then a, a wire mother. And he noted that the type of mother, obviously the, the, the optimal one being the actual monkey mother, uh, actually impacted the monkey's social development. They developed 
more pro-social behaviors, so behaviors that you know got them accepted by other monkeys and uh, led to uh, uh, positive, beneficial behaviors and a and a larger, more enjoyable lifespan. Um, with the the highest course being with the regular mother that had regular affection and contact with a cold-blooded creature and got the care and attention. Uh, the cloth mother did the second best because at least they could still sort of get that physical contact and cling to the mother, even though it wasn't necessarily clinging back. They still had that. But the monkeys that did the worst, and again, it was a pretty clear t -t -t tier, uh, step down between each uh, type. The, the wire monkeys did the worst because you, it was difficult to cuddle with or feel um, protected by or embraced by a wired, like a literally a metal wire mother. Um, and that was a pretty, well, clearly unethical, not as unethical as the next one I'm gonna tell you about. Uh, it did show that actual attention and affection affects your development. So whether it's tied to the monkey being more stressed uh, because they don't feel like the wire mother or the cloth mother is attending to their needs, or uh, they feel less physically comforted, which can reduce their stress. Uh, regardless of what it actually is, the factor, you need that physical attention and affection from a caregiver uh, constantly uh, to actually develop normally. Because again, it did actually make them smaller, less social, lo lo uh, less uh, shorter lifespans, uh, more aggressive. That's, of course, uh, an antisocial behavior. Uh, all of those factors uh, correlated with the uh, amount of physical affection and attention they got from the mother obviously starting with the regular mother, then the cloth, then the wire mother at the bottom. Uh, so he uh, showed the importance, showed importance of um, affection and um, attention. And obviously the less physical comfort uh, and attention you get uh, as a primate developing, and this applies to children too, they didn't do these experiments on kids, thankfully, uh, and thankfully they don't do them on animals anymore either, but it was important for us to, to find out how important that actually was to have. The pit of despair thing <clears throat> that I mentioned, the, the terrible uh, research, those were certain monkeys he actually isolated uh, in what was called the pit of despair, a terrible name and a terrible experiment, but he actually completely isolated these, um, these young monkeys from birth, never got a mother, never got any social interaction, he gave them the food and all that stuff, uh, but when he would introduce them to society, they could not assimilate. They were uh, in incredibly antisocial, much smaller, much more stressed, much sh shorter lifespans. Uh, they were essentially a crazy version of what you think a monkey would be. Um, uh, just like a person, if you were to isolate a person, uh, that's, that, that has, can have a very damaging effect on their, their, their psyche, their mind, their physical development, their, their stress. Uh, it really says something when you look at prisons, which are essentially taking the most, you obviously have some people that were falsely imprisoned or imprisoned for nonviolent crimes, but we're talking about the convicted, actually guilty, uh, violent, uh, you know, uh, aggressive rapists, killers, etc. When you put them all into one location, and the worst thing you can do is, is put them in solitary confinement and isolate them from somebody when the only other people they can react or interact with are other um, um, highly antisocial people, like that says a lot about humans, uh, that we actually do better even with awful social engagements than we do with no social engagements whatsoever. Uh, so that is, uh, so importance of affection and, and attention on uh, normal or healthy development. And uh, they didn't use the extreme measures of this experiment uh, to uh, corroborate this and, and, and extend it to human development as well. Uh, but they did have a much more <clears throat> ethical way of noting the impact of affection and attention on kids. So, uh, first let me talk about a topic which is referred to as temperament. Temperament is uh, it's a biological predisposition. So, again, this is part of the personality you inherit from your mother and father or, or the combination of their genes. So it might not be like, oh, this is your dad's temperament. Oh, this is your mother's temperament. It, it can almost certainly and almost always is some variation of that. Uh, so you usually see qualities of the mother and the father in the child, but it doesn't mean that it's just a carbon copy right on down to the next generation. Uh, it is inherited largely uh, and is largely genetic. So temperament is, it's a part of personality. It's like one of the earliest personality markers you can see. Uh, this is basically how, how do I phrase this? How intensely and how frequently 
children respond to emotions uh, or situations. So certain babies cry much easier than others. Like uh, they cry more frequently, they cry much more loudly, uh, they uh, cry much more intensely, that's kind of with the loudly, but like, I mean, not just making a scream noise, they're actually like flailing, they're turned red, lots of tears, saliva, all that stuff. Um, that's largely temperament. Uh, and it's kind of uh, bimodal, like they're either, well, there, there's a spectrum, but there's, it's kind of a two-sided spectrum where they either cry and are difficult and frustrated often at the extreme, those are the difficult babies, and you have the uh, other extreme, which are those complacent, relaxed, happy babies that are just super emotionally stable, almost never cry if they do, it's very short and it's not very intense. Uh, that's sort of the spectrum you have here, but I'm just gonna give the, the two titles that you would use which are easy babies and difficult babies. So that's preset. And you can tell almost immediately where your kid falls on that spectrum. First couple months, you'll have an idea if that kid's gonna be more towards the easy side or on the easy side or more towards the middle or more towards the, or on the uh, difficult side. And there's, there's not a whole lot you can do to change it. If they're difficult, they're gonna be difficult probably forever to a certain degree, but it's not actually hopeless in that it's just like, well, that kid's just gonna be difficult no matter what, or oh, that kid's gonna be uh, uh, easy no matter what. They actually found you can improve it slightly. Now again, you're not gonna go from the most extreme case of difficult baby all the way over to completely complacent uh, or vice versa, but uh, you can actually shift the, uh, it more towards the center at least, especially with the more extreme uh, cases. So again, easy baby, happy, complacent, also consistent too, like consistently eats and naps at the same times. Uh, difficult babies, of course, are generally unhappy. I did a happy with one P. There we go, fix that. Uh, they're generally unhappy. Um, they are uh, fussy, like they, they cry or whine often, uh, and they are often inconsistent uh, with their sleeping or eating schedules. Uh, you can have some variants. Obviously, there's stages like when they're teething or they're going through a developmental milestone in their brain. They might struggle with consistency in sleep or, or, or eating, even if they are an easy baby. But across <clears throat> the span of their development, they'll generally be more or less uh, of one of those two, unless they're, of course, you know, right dead on the center. What they found was your parenting, just, and this, again, corroborates Harry Harlow's findings, uh, can affect how easy or difficult that they are. So again, you can kind of rein them in towards the center. Um, obviously most people don't really need to rein in the easy babies because they're easy and enjoyable, but certainly they want to rein in the difficult babies because it's, it's, just not, it's just not a good experience for anybody if the baby's just constantly upset and constantly stressed out and constantly trying, uh, crying. Even the best parents will, are, are gonna get exhausted and worn out uh, doing that all day. And, and waking up constantly because they don't have a steady sleep schedule and all that. So you always want to improve it uh, for the baby. It's healthy for the baby to not be stressed out and, and be consistent in their feeding and sleeping so they can develop properly. But it's also good for the parents because they'll, they'll burn out and then they might end up presenting their kid and, and, and treating them worse in the long run. So they found that parents um, that <clears throat> gave more, more attention and physical affection and verbal affection too. So like speaking softly to your baby, rather than like saying, be quiet or stop crying or whatever. Um, ones that were more compassionate, I gave more attention to it, uh, so didn't let it cry for too long. If it did cry, they immediately tried to, you know, console it, uh, at least for the first year. Uh, by the way, I gotta add this caveat. This really only applies to the first year or so of life. Uh, after a year, when they can communicate better, it doesn't just mean you have to drop everything and, and, and stop them from crying, given what they want. That's actually damaging. You can actually turn them into spoiled brats if you do that, at least if they get further along in the two and three year old range. Uh, first year though, for the most part, it's pretty much baby calls the shots uh, because if they are crying, there legitimately could be something wrong uh, and you legitimately have to uh, console them, uh, which is why people who are more agreeable and compassionate by temperament, by personality, do a much better job of caregiving. Uh, on average, that's women, but you can definitely have women who are not very compassionate, uh, or you can have men that are more on the compassionate side and do a better job. But if you took the whole group as a whole, 
for men and women and, and weighed their, their agreeableness and their compassion, women tend to do better. They tend to be more patient, more, more caring, more empathetic, um, and more compassionate than men do. But there is individual variance, obviously. Uh, and there are some evolutionary factors in that uh, as well. But uh, nonetheless, you can vary individually uh, in that male or female category as far as how compassionate uh, or good of a caregiver you are. Nonetheless, the more attention, physical attention, uh, or physical affection and, and, and care you give, uh, the better the child does, generally speaking. So, and they tested this. They would have, uh, they gave, they basically took the babies that were easy and difficult, and they gave them each two variants. Uh, parents that were uh, very caring and very attentive and very affectionate, and they had parents that were the opposite, that were much more uh, delayed and dismissive and non-affectionate, and they gave, uh, they kept track. Uh, easy babies got a bit worse if their parents were not giving them uh, adequate affection and attention uh, and, and physical uh, contact. Uh, but the biggest difference was, and it, it wasn't huge, but there was actually a difference in the difficult babies that got the uh, love and attention uh, and physical uh, connection. Uh, like skin to skin, you know, not letting them pry it out, you know, giving them the, the attention and consultant they needed. It actually did improve the difficult babies who would either get worse or stay just as bad with the parents that weren't paying attention to them uh, as well or weren't being as affectionate. Uh, it did actually move them towards the center a bit. Uh, again, it didn't make them go from difficult to easy, but it did rein them in more towards the center uh, and they did develop, <clears throat> they developed uh, better. Both babies when compared to their uh, other um, control group on the difficult and easy spec uh, spectrum, they both did better than their peers with the um, uh, less affectionate, less attentive parents. So again, the, the easy babies that got the affectionate parents and attentive parents, as opposed to the easy babies that didn't, that got the less affectionate, less attentive, they developed uh, quicker, they were bigger and healthier uh, and happier. And same with the difficult babies. Again, they were still on the difficult side of the spectrum, but they were much improved as far as their developmental milestones go, their ability, their actual physical size, uh, and their overall health uh, was higher than their unattentive, unaffectionate uh, peer control group. So uh, that is a <clears throat> fair degree of evidence that supports this, um, the necessity of attention and affection uh, and compassion given to uh, uh, children, certainly. Uh, at that early age. So again, the first year, <clears throat> crying it out, that's an old, outdated theory. We know that actually damages children neurologically because then they feel scared, they feel safe, they feel stressed all the time. It, it diverts that their energy from developing their neural networks properly and the resources and energy and protein they use to do that, and instead <clears throat> uh, diverts it towards the stress response uh, and, and crying and um, reacting to that. Uh, so it can actually deprive them. So again, temperament, largely genetic. It's one of the first markers of their personality. Um, but uh, it, it, you can have an impact as a parent to some degree. You're not going to completely shift it, but you, you can shift it a bit. So more attention to physical uh, and verbal affection equals healthier uh, development. So it's quite critical uh, that we have that in there. I'm trying to think if I forgot anything. Nope, that's pretty much it. So um, where we'll pick up once I erase this, uh, we'll pick up on uh, adolescence and teens and then uh, gender differences. And the, um, so the data, the average data between gender differences and then some of the social and biological theories that, it, that attempt to explain it.